What up, Coordination? How you doing? On the pod today, we have Rocco, who is the founder of Spruce. Rocco and I go way back. We're both incubated at Consensus. Gitcoin was incubated at Consensus. Rocco worked at Consensus back a couple of market cycles ago, and so we've been friends for a long time. Following his work working on Spruce ID and more recently sign in with Ethereum, which is an open standard for how you can prove to an app that you own an account and you can give it information associated with that account. Uh, so we're talking about decentralized identity, decentralized reputation, decentralized society, all of the good stuff that decentralized reputation could enable in this episode. So just really quickly re revisit that thesis. Decentralized identity is regen because it's going to enable more positive sum games and repeat interactions between participants in the decentralized society that is being built on Web3. And that is why sign in with Ethereum matters. It is the portal through which an application can get access to your data in a privacy preserving way and create a more decentralized society and regenerative crypto economic internet. So uh, Rocco is one of the unseen voices and unseen heroes of decentralized identity. And so I'm just really excited to be on this episode and talk about sign in with Ethereum and Spruce and Spruce ID with him. Uh, also just a great guy. Like I said, I've known him for years and it's been really fun to follow their journey. So without further ado, I'll give you Rocco and Spruce IG. Enjoy coordination. Working in Web3 is awesome. It's freeing, powerful, and so much fun. But working outside of the typical W2 employee structure is a deal breaker for so many people. Opolis is helping the self-sovereign worker focus on what they do best, their work, while Opolis manages the back end. There's a lot of nation state overhead when working in Web3, and Opolis takes care of all of the back end stuff, freeing you up to do what you do best, your work. Opolis leverages group buying power through a community employment co-op, helping you save 20 to 50% on high quality, affordable healthcare options through Cigna. So do what you love and maintain your financial security with Opolis. You must be authorized to work inside the United States to receive Opolis's benefits, but Opolis is expanding its services to Canada starting on June 1st of next year. So book a 30 minute free consultation with Opolis experts and join Opolis by December 31st to get a thousand work and a thousand bank tokens. Go to connect.opolis.co slash bankless to get started. Goldfinch is a decentralized credit protocol with a mission to connect the world's capital to the world's growth. Goldfinch focuses on real yields from real companies. So start lending your USDC to real businesses driving growth worldwide. Goldfinch's borrowers are proven fintechs and credit funds in emerging markets who need access to Goldfinch's capital to drive economic growth in regions faced with barriers to financial access. In just under two years, Goldfinch has loaned over 100 million USDC, reaching over a million people and businesses across 28 countries. Goldfinch is doing what DeFi was always meant to do, expanding financial access to those who have historically been shut out of the TradFi system. So become a Goldfinch member to put your USDC to work, empowering real businesses growth. Join Goldfinch's new member vaults to be an active investor and take part in supporting Goldfinch's security and expansion. Receive yield enhancements generated by protocol revenue, plus access exclusive communication channels and more. So go to goldfinch.finance to get started. All right, what's up, Rocco? Hey, how you doing, Kevin? Good. Um, really excited to talk to you about Spruce. So uh, tell us what Spruce is and how you got to be working on this problem. Spruce is working on decentralized identity and data. And one of our core tenets is we want to make sure that users control their identity and data across the web. Uh, you see a lot of what's going on in the crypto space, especially around assets. How can that also translate over to users owning and controlling their identity as well? Probably the core way of, of summarizing what we're working on at Spruce. A lot, a lot of it being developer focused, uh, purely on uh, bringing yep. open source software to the world and letting users implement these kinds of workflows into their dApps and regular applications too, uh, and try to make yeah. it as easy as possible for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's maybe spend five minutes on your, your history and how you got to be working on this problem. Yeah, so before Spruce times, um, I was at a different tree known as Alpine. Uh, over on the consensus side of things. So uh, my co-founder, Wayne, and I worked over at Consensus uh, years back. And, uh, and I just have to interject that you and I worked together at Consensus. I think you were out yeah. in Boulder for a summer and we we hung out for, not a summer, but like at least a month uh, while we were both at Consensus. I do remember that. I do miss the mountain views too. The views out there are beautiful. And uh, we were working on uh, decentralized identity at the time over at Consensus. And Consensus was probably one of the leading organizations putting resourcing into decentralized identity that many years back, like really early to the trend with like the folks over at Uport and the work they were doing way early on in terms of bringing decentralized identity uh, over to the Ethereum ecosystem and beyond and like understanding that the keys we use in 
crypto land uh, translate well to like, you know, these decentralized identity paradigms. And some of the focus we had at Consensus, Wayne and I were on uh, platform economies, namely that a lot of companies in the space were trying to rebuild a lot of different forms of platform economies uh, at the time, but in a decentralized manner, like tilting some of the things towards users more so than platforms reaping a lot of fees. And one of the things that was missing at the time uh, was the trust portion of the transaction. How do you handle knowing who you're dealing with on these platforms if it's all decentralized? And namely, a lot of these things we could operate as like a public key, like zero X, you know, yada, yada, yada. But let's say you kind of have the example of like a decentralized Airbnb uh, where folks want to stay at a place over time. We're trying to reduce the amount of uh, fees that platforms take and really keep it between the owner and the person uh, renting the space. You're going to need a couple of things, namely the legal portion of the identity, which is does that person actually own the space and have the rights to rent that space out? The reputational identity, does this person have a good reputation over time of like being a good renter or being a good person uh, leasing the space out to someone and everything is kind of in order as it should be? And lastly, you know, you're not, you have like certain safety checks with reputational identity, like you're not going to get serial murdered overnight. Um, so beyond kind of just us sending uh, assets to a smart contract, kind of locking it up and having this decentralized Airbnb, how do you slowly reintroduce just the right amount of information uh, for the counterparties to make sure that the transaction is safe in different ways? And that was a big part of how we got started over at Spruce. And around 2020, we were an independent organization specifically working on libraries uh, to bring these decentralized identity paradigms into play um, and implementing them on applications. And most recently, a lot of our work for the last year focused on uh, sign-in with Ethereum. And what a lot of that has to do is, is uh, the first part of kind of identity, especially when dealing with apps and services on the internet, is around signing in. That first interaction that you take when you interact and interface with something is that sign-in portion. And uh, that's been a lot of the focus of our work ever since. Uh, and it's been a pretty wild ride, but I, I love kind of how the space is slowly evolving into these two areas and folks realizing that at the center of all these things are keys, that all the stuff you do on the financial side deals with keys and all the stuff that you do on the identity side is also using that same key pair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, uh, you know, while we're sort of traversing this design space, I guess I'll just say out loud what my thesis of, so, you know, Green Pill is all about regenerative Web3 and things that are pro-social with Web3. And uh, the reason why we've been spending some time this season talking about identity is that if you can track identities, and, and I don't just mean like, you know, I'm Kevin and you're Gregory Rocco uh, identities, but also like persistent pseudonymous identities online, then what you can do is you can start to have repeat interactions between these actors and you can start to track, okay, this is the social uh, attributes of this counterparty that I'm working with. And you can start to have through repeat interactions, you can also start to have positive sum games between the actors in the ecosystem, which wasn't possible in DeFi without collateral, you know? Um, and so if you can complexify the identity space, then you can start to take the positive sum actors and put them in a certain bucket, give them access to features and protocols. And that's where, you know, kind of like the regen, uh, one plus one equals three in, in that kind of world with identity. And so, you know, I know that we're talking a lot about the technology, private keys, sign in with Ethereum here. And and I just wanted to make sure for the listener that we connect the sort of like regen thesis uh, to to the identity piece there. And so I don't know if you have any any comments on that. If not, I have more more questions about your work. No, and I think that's important, too, because like for a user, how does someone show up to an app or service uh, with they have with what they have already and show that service exactly what it needs to know for that interaction without mm -hmm. oversharing, without doing too much. And really like you have these kind of privacy preserving uh, items in there as well. Like how do you bring everything together and the user can go across these different interactions and make sure that they have the ability to show themselves and what is needed just for that interaction without that oversharing for each, for each instance as mm -hmm. well, like user protections as well, especially as we move way more digitally. Yep. I think that that's really a key point, you know, as we as we start to build this more regenerative, positive some world, uh, that it doesn't have to come at the cost of privacy and sovereignty of the user's data, which I think is something new that people don't don't necessarily realize when they get into checking out this design space. And and to me, that just makes it all that the more exciting. Yeah. And I think a lot of it deals specifically with like 
especially with like identity and data, how do you reverse the login? Um, mm -hmm. Where instead of a user logging into a platform or site, that platform or site now has to log into that user's data vault or wherever they're holding their data, where the user mm -hmm. brings everything with them to the session rather than the app kind of storing it on their behalf, having like kind of a fragmented version of you across different apps. How do you just come to an app and present it yourself and be like, here I am, this is everything associated with me that I'm consenting to give you. Uh, and that's kind of the end of it. And these apps don't even have to hold user data anymore. Users can mm -hmm. just bring it with them for that session. And now apps can, instead of competing on how much data they can store about users, apps can now compete on the services they offer rather than competing on how much data they can store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in a world, and you know, we just need to say it out loud. This might be obvious to to me and you, but you know, with all the data leaks that have been happening, where people try to hoard all this data about their users, and then you know, they get hacked and they accidentally, like, you know, uh, I think it's Equifax has it, it's one of the big three has leaked my identity data, um, and their whole business is storing identity data and in, in credit scoring data uh, about me, and so that should tell you how broken the security paradigm of of uh, web two and before data is. And I think that people don't even realize it uh, because it's like a fish being in water. Like you don't even realize that, uh, you know, oh, well, it's water around us. Uh, uh, there's there's everyone storing all of my data all the time. It's like all we've ever known. So there's a little bit of an opportunity to show people that there's another world that's possible here. Yeah, and a lot of it came from like when internet standards were coming out, when when apps were starting to become a dominant force in like the web two era, there was no standard way of doing user controlled identity. So every service mm -hmm. just was like, okay, I have to onboard you in some way, shape, or form, get you onto this app or service here, fill mm -hmm. in, you know, your name, your last name, your username, your password. So every app just slowly began to have a different version of you. And then all yeah. of them built moats around those particular versions of you. And then it wasn't until later on that user controlled identity standards kind of came into the play where it's like, okay, what if we flip this model? And what if the user just presents themselves? But a lot of it came from like everything being built so quickly and just that became the moat, like user user data just became the moat for a lot of these apps and services. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, and it's worth stating that if if each app isn't building its own moat, then what happens is that all Web3 apps are building up their own data moats together. And I think that what's really exciting for, for me about that is that there's been a whole era of Web2 applications that uh, have just cornered their categories because they have such big data moats and no one can compete with them anymore. I'm, I'm sort of subtweeting Facebook and Twitter and all those other social networks that have this network effect where all my friends are in Twitter. And uh, because of that, I'm going to be at Twitter. And because of because of that, all my friends are at Twitter. There's like this infinite loop uh, of this network effects that's being climbed. But you can imagine someone, I don't know, let's say Lens Protocol, building a Web3 social network and making the social graph open source so that anyone can derive from it. And then anyone who starts a Web3 social app can just start on third base because they've got all of that data and network effects there. And so I think that it really builds a more pro-consumer and pro-citizen web when you can take your data from site to site and you're not locked into these little, you know, these little uh, walled gardens. And that's exactly what it is too from the crypto space. It's like we have a lot of these different apps you could use that rely on the same smart contracts, but are just kind of different front ends, different experiencer folks. But the second you go to that other front end, that other application, it's kind of the same rails behind everything. The smart contracts that are on, like, let's say the Ethereum blockchain, for example. And like you're saying with this, you could have, you know, these open social media protocols where you can have, uh, you know, the green pill uh, social space where, you know, you take the user kind of brings their posts, followers and everything with them. I could have, a, you know, a different social media app and it's all the same data that's being brought back and forth, but we're just kind of different purpose built, different themes, uh, different services we may have on each application, but the underlying data is just coming to each one. It's kind of unlocked as part of that equation. And it really uh, gets rid of those bad incentives like for hoarding data. And like, like you're saying, you and I can, you know, we go to Twitter because we know that's where all of our tweets are, all of our followers are, all of our network data is. But in this kind of new open world of, uh, of, Unlock data and user controlled data doesn't matter the front end because all of it kind of comes with you. And these st these standards are also these uh, data formats and standards are all interoperable. Is that you know my platform and your platform read the same thing and understand the same language? Uh, these standards are almost like the battle yeah. fish for data. So maybe let's let's dive in on one of those specific standards, and uh, it's sign in with Ethereum that I hear you always talking about. 
So is this like I go to an app and instead of just connecting my wallet, I actually sign in with Ethereum and then the app gets some sort of data about me? So uh, the sign with Ethereum standard, a lot of it deals specifically with like, how do you first, how do you prevent big login? Uh, is, is a joke we use kind of internally and sometimes talk about is like, how do you go away from large login providers where if you were using a Google account to sign in with things and Google ever decided to pull the rug on you, you wouldn't mm. just lose access to Google services. You'd also lose access to everything you signed in with Google too. Mm. So every time you hit that sign with Google button, even if it's a total third party service, you lose access to that Google account. You just lost your mm. identifier, the thing you're using to tell that app who you are. Uh, in the sign with Ethereum case, these are keys you control and, and these, these Ethereum accounts you, that only you control to get into these apps and services. And a big part of what we're doing with that is kind of bridging the gap from, well, actually, first, it'd probably be good if I talked about the difference between connecting a wallet and signing in with Ethereum. Let's do it, yeah. Because they're, yeah, because they're two different actions that sometimes get um, mixed up a little bit sometimes. So when you connect a wallet to an app or a dApp rather, that you're not kind of giving anything, the, the dApp anything other than the means to serve you a transaction, like some on, kind of on-chain transaction saying, yep, you know, you're trying to make this trade, you know, here, here's a transaction to make mm -hmm. that trade. When you're signing a message, you're actually proving you are the owner of that account. And by doing that, the app can trust that, yes, it's you. It could potentially remember things about you like preferences, for example, the goal obviously being to move this towards the user, bringing that, all that with them. But it's the first step in having experiences of dApps rival that of traditional apps, that the dApp can remember something about you, that you know when you set up a profile, it's all there for you when you come back. Uh, one of the good early examples of this was OpenSea. So in OpenSea, you could use OpenSea by just connecting a wallet and you know using the NFT marketplace and trading things. But the second you want to set up a profile on OpenSea, it requires you to sign a message. And that message is like, you know, I'm signing into OpenSea, a couple of other details. And then once you sign that message, OpenSea's like, oh, this person controls that account. They are, the, they are now logged in. And we could remember these profile details about them. So when they come back, it's all there for them when they get back. And what the whole sign with Ethereum initiative was, was standardizing that message format. That, you know, when you get served that thing in your wallet that's like, sign this message, it's very much, how do you standardize that? So that wallets can then tell the user, hey, you're signing into this. Where it's getting like just that much better with UX so that the wallet's not like sign the random message, but instead saying you're actually signing into this app or service. And even providing users mm. with better UX around signing in, such as domain binding. And what that means is that if you're on a phishing site that's trying to scam you and it's asking you to sign off on something that doesn't match the site you're on, like if it's a phishing site for OpenSea, for example, the wallet being able to warn you and say, hey, you're on a phishing site right now, you're getting scammed. So just getting that much closer to more of a traditional login experience, but using mm. your Ethereum account, using the wallet that you control, the identifier you control. Where we move even deeper is that's, that's the authentication. That's the login. You're logging into a site or service. The second part of that is how do you actually bring data with you? So we're working on a couple of standards as well to help like, you're not just to make it so that you're not just like logging in, but also authorizing access to like a data vault that you control mm. and you can bring this data to a session with you. That even if it's right. even it's if it's something like the first name, last name thing, even if it's something like dark mode or light mode, that you're able mm -hmm. to do that just by signing in with Ethereum. So the first step was how do we get the login right? The second step is how we brought our identifier. Second step is how do we now bring our data with us? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of background on the kind of connect wallet signing with Ethereum differences. Th so as a developer, the way I conceptualize this is that Connect Wallet simply has the wallet tell the site that I am user Awaki.eth, but sign in with Ethereum actually has me sign a message with my private key to prove that I'm Awaki.eth. And it's a stronger guarantee than the connecting, which is just the wallet attesting for it. Is that the technical difference or am I That's directionally right? Completely. So it's like I could always spoof a walkie.eth if I just had the connect wallet flow. Mm. Someone can come in, put an extension yeah. in front of like so MetaMask. I, I fork for example. MetaMask to have it lie about who I am, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's like an extension out there that like I am Vitalik.eth. And it's just kind of like <laughs> can sit in front of existing wallets, connect yeah. to that. So the app's like, okay, I guess you're Vitalik.eth. But as soon as you send them a transaction, like you can't, they can't actually sign yeah. on that and make that transaction. 
So the signing the message part's like, yes, I am in fact able to demonstrate control over this wallet. Right. Beautiful. Well, so, I mean, it seems like sign in with Ethereum. Let's maybe talk about all the really beautiful data that can piggyback on top of me signing in with Ethereum. So, I mean, you know, could we, could we maybe get into that ecosystem and what use cases you're really excited about there? Sure. So some of the early stuff around like the space that I see kind of popping up, especially with the work over on the Gitcoin passport side, some of the work, work we're doing on credentialing and others in the space is how does a user, um, some of the early, early cases is like two I see, a lot of it first being around creator authenticity. So how do creators in the NFT world like have assurances for other folks buying their works that they are who they say they are in these places? that you're not doing an onboarding every single time you go to a new NFT marketplace. And instead you're bringing things like a Twitter account that's associated with your name or a Dribbble profile or a DeviantArt account that's associated with your name and bringing that with you no matter where you're logging in. And all of these platforms just recognize that immediately because they're able to verify that you have that credential, that it was issued in a way that makes a lot of sense to them and that you as a user can use that across all these services in the NFT side. Uh, and even on the DAO side, like how does someone create a profile with enough assurances about who they are so that when they do put up a proposal or they do get involved in the discourse going on about voting on a proposal, even if it's like funding public goods, for example, that there is, uh, the folks have the ability to know that they are who they say they are or have assurances about who this person is making these, uh, uh statements about certain things, um, and kind of joining these kinds of, uh, uh, these conversations about what's going on, uh, especially like in the immediate low assurance credentialing use cases, like I'm bringing social media accounts with me. We're not even like at the point of like driver's licenses, government documents, reusable KYC. Those are like the big, big, like, how do we eventually like make all, all this stuff kind of open and easier to use even down to like the small low assurance use cases, like a social media account. How do we even take that with us throughout all these interactions? Because even that's super powerful, especially as we do a lot of these social coordination games around things we work on in the space that I think that's even those are powerful in and of themselves. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses that need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage its treasury and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the highly secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single chain treasury management to expressive, flexible and multi-chain treasury features such as global user management, global contacts, proposal management and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Masari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. You have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. The world has woken up to refi and Celo is here for it. Celo is the layer one for the regenerative finance movement. It's fast, planet positive, and built for the real world. Celo has committed to producing a sustainable future from day one and has built its technology around one of the lowest carbon impact consensus mechanisms and is the world's first carbon negative EVM compatible layer one blockchain. Celo is a movement to create the conditions of prosperity for everyone, whether it's tokenizing carbon credits with Toucan, providing capital to underserved communities with Unicorn, or building for millions of users around the globe. Celo was created to transform crypto enthusiasts into a movement of change makers. Follow along on Twitter at Celo.org to learn more about how Celo is accelerating refi for a positive, lasting impact on people, communities, and the planet. And if you're a builder interested in refi, be sure to join the Build with Celo hackathon live now with a prize pool of over $100,000. I mean, it seems like there's such a diversity of different data riders that we could have uh, once more apps integrate with sign in with Ethereum that I'm really excited to see this ecosystem flourish. And of course, you know, the one I'm I'm more familiar with is Gitcoin Passport, because back when I was at Gitcoin, we were kind of uh, starting to think about what would have to be true for our for Gitcoin to take the civil resistance data that it that it has and make it accessible to other applications, of course, with the permission of, of, of users uh, authorizing their data silos. And so you can imagine that someone signs in with Ethereum and if 
the they authorize the app to have it, then you could get their Gitcoin Passport score and from that application. And then all of a sudden that application knows, oh, I can treat this user as a civil resistant user instead of just a regular user. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, it just seems like there's a totally broad design space, but it could get really deep in each of these individual application niches, just depending on what kind of data is emergently created and what users will authorize. Yeah. And I'm thinking too about uh, if you could even blend things from the uh, Gitcoin passport, like uh, credentials with even on-chain information. Like for example, you have uh, assurances around civil resistance from these social media accounts, from these accounts across the web tied to this this identifier, this key. What if you could also blend that with on-chain information as well? What if it's kind of even drilled down to beyond just like has made a transaction to like has made over 10 Uniswap trades within a certain period and that gets issued as a credential and that used like on-chain blended with off-chain to get even higher assurances about civil resistance, like that a user is in fact a unique user and just kind of showing up to something with that with enough assurances for whatever the application is. Let's say it's an airdrop. Let's say it's for increased benefits on an app or service. Now you could even not even just use the off-chain stuff, the stuff that's coming from Web 2, but also natively Web 3 things and kind of have this blended experience from both sides. Yeah, I mean, I think that that gets pretty interesting. And it it might be worth, (laughs) just for the listener who doesn't spend their full time on this, talking about the difference between on-chain credentials and off-chain credentials, which I don't think that we've covered yet, but verifiable credentials stored off-chain on something like Ceramic are different from something that's stored on-chain and and directly connected to your at, to your address and there's the the big difference there to me is the privacy implications of of having something connected on chain that anyone can just read versus an off chain thing that I have to like sign in to give access to yeah one of the is that right or things, close yeah no that's that's completely right and one of the important things too is uh when we talk about credentials like this they are off chain so you know users have this these like privacy preserving ways of using them um, and a big thing about the on-chain credentialing, and you could actually represent stuff that happened on-chain as an off-chain credential. Like mm-hmm. I could issue you, Kevin, a credential that said you made more than 10 Uniswap trades. I'll issue that off-chain, but the evidence for that will be some on-chain information. Maybe we'll hit an indexer. Maybe we'll hit some service that gives us the evidence for that information. Um, but I think where it gets even more interesting is when you could start using these off-chain credentials uh, on-chain in different ways. Like, let's say you have a fully autonomous system with smart contracts. Like, imagine if you could use those credentials with that smart contract now. And that smart contract is no, like, you know, has to have a Twitter account associated with the public key. The only way for that smart contract to understand that is if it's on-chain in some way, or if yeah. there's an Oracle, something that feeds yeah. off-chain information on-chain in some efficient way. So there's like a huge, like, mix and match design space of what can be off-chain, what could be on-chain. But... I'm more along the lines of like things in terms of like uh, personal information remaining off chain in different ways. Yeah. So long as it could be privacy preserving at the end of the day, that the user kind of has full control over the information. Uh, you might have some emerging things to somehow get that on chain in a privacy preserving way, but I think that's just kind of the core of it. As long as that information is protected for that person, then kind of the format is whatever is easier. But as long as that information right. is protected. And we should say that, like, you know, for on-chain data, there is ways to protect the privacy. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of zero-knowledge proofs uh, when I say that out loud. But, uh, yeah, I know that when the DSOC paper came out, this was a big big controversy that that happened. Yeah, soul-bound tokens. That was was probably the one burning question was, like, how do we make sure that whatever is going on-chain stamped in the ledger of record forever isn't my social security number? And that isn't ever possibly leaked in any possible way. And that's probably still one of the most important things, especially for the folks experimenting with on-chain credentials to just always make sure designing for privacy first is super important because you don't want to have like this immutable stamp. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and this is not like when you're designing for a web two app where like the server goes down and it goes away, the blockchain is forever. So, uh, well, you know, Depends on the blockchain, but uh, <laughs> the Ethereum mainnet, I think we can assume, is reached escape velocity and is going to be around forever. So, um, you know, you just have to take privacy way more seriously because you're going through a one-way door when you deploy something to a blockchain. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's as long as that's kind of the core of folks looking to do identity on chain, as long as that's at the core of their their principles and reasoning and philosophy around it, then then it's cool. 
Like as long as we're just not per- personal information on chain, that's not encrypted, not private by default, just very scary uh, when it's immutable like that. But uh, there are folks, a lot of folks working in that space right now and making sure that that is a possibility. So definitely hats off to them. Yeah, totally. Um, what are the what are the categories of things that sign in with Ethereum enables that that you're most excited about right now? I think one of the things that I'm a big fan of is uh, how do you log in on behalf of a DAO? I mm-hmm. think um, this has been a little bit of a problem for a while where if you have a multi-sig or a multi-sig wallet, so like, let's say, uh, you know, in order a multi-sig wallet, you just need multiple people to sign off on something or multiple wallets to sign off on something to make a transaction go through mm-hmm. in a multi-sig wallet. So if, you know, you and I set up a multi-sig and with the, you know, we can make it two, two out of two. So both of us have to sign and right. approve something in order to make something go. <clears throat> but this has been a, a problem for a lot of DAOs and a lot of organizations or even individuals who use multi-sigs is how do you sign into apps or dApps using that multi-sig? You know, traditionally in, in corporate world, it's like we always have the designated social media person, but it's one person representing the organization. It's not like a hundred of us are sitting around a computer and, uh, you know, all a hundred of us have our hand on the mouse and <laughs> clicking on things on right. the app or service. It's always one person. And this really never translated well yet in terms of dApps where multi-sigs can, you know, just take off-chain actions and have an account on a platform. Uh, folks did it in a couple of bespoke ways, but um, one of the things I'm super excited about is if like a, the workflow where a multi-sig is able to say, these keys, these these people are the ones that can log in on behalf of this multi-sig. So if a DAO had a member that, you know, can control the social media accounts, like the decentralized social media accounts, if a DAO had a member that did like the proposal drafting uh, in certain instances, or even managed the profile of that DAO on a governance platform, that now there is a workflow where an individual can do that. The DAO or multi-sig can say, yep, that's the individual that can log in. And when that user goes to sign in with Ethereum, the DAO can ask them, hey, did you mean as yourself? So let's say me, Rocco, or on behalf of the multi-sig or one of these multi-sigs that you are a delegate of. And I'm also very excited to like start splitting that out. So you could have one person be the social media person. You could have one person manage the DAO profile on this website and have these very narrow scopes for each of these things. Um, Mm -hmm. Before this was a very difficult thing, but uh, thankfully working with the folks over at Gnosis Safe, this has now been enabled, which is great. But now it's like, what are the even deeper use cases of like single delegation to certain apps or certain verticals? Um, again, like yeah. social media app, like the profile management app, the proposal management app that each individual can now represent a different thing, similar to how we do it in traditional companies. Like there's a social yeah. media person, there's a person managing this account, but mm-hmm. now like kind of fully Web3 enabled uh, yeah. and having this design space happen. And also, again, just using wallets. And I think that's a core yeah. basis for a lot of what excites me about sign with Ethereum, even just beyond the mm-hmm. identity stuff is how do you take these wallets that folks are using? And beyond just financial transactions, what else can you do with them? Right. I think that's the core of a lot of this work for all the folks yeah. working on identity, for all the folks working on decentralized data, is how do you take you know, individuals using wallets and say, hey, wait, there's a ton more you can do with this. That yeah. is this mode of like sovereign operation beyond just finances and, con- I mean, and having someone... like full user control. Yeah, totally. I mean, as someone who's worked on enterprise, oh man, am I, I'm getting, I'm shuddering, but I'm thinking about my uh... corporate America days. <laughs> Uh, but you know, enterprise access management was just like something that there was whole teams at, at this corporation I worked at and, um, you know, just having that all be open source and permissionless, I think is really a huge step forward. But, you know, when I think about what decentralized identity is going to enable, I think about things like web three social being able to take my social graph from site to site or under collateralized lending or civil resistance, you know, like a little bit more consumer oriented applications. But, you know, it's great. It's it's amazing to have the sort of consumer stuff and the enterprise stuff on the same structure because that enables you to do, you know, whatever innovation you enable for your DAO can be enabled for you as an individual user and vice versa. But I'm wondering if there's anything in that, like, category of more consumer-oriented stuff that you're really excited about being built on top of sign-in with Ethereum. No, I think, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there, especially around the social space, is that the one thing that I saw the space take a great turn, I'd say probably in the 2019, 2020, 
was more into the social space and not even just social media, just like pure interactions as individuals uh, beyond just the dap that could kind of make money go from point A to point B, which is super important in its own right. I never want to downplay uh, like, you know, like uh, the finance side of crypto, but I think signing with Ethereum really represents that other side of like those interactions, those social interactions, like decentralized social media, um, artists in the NFT space and how we communicate. I think that's kind of the world that's unlocked here outside of the financial use cases. Like how do we start having these more contextual interactions in the space as opposed to just connecting a wallet and making a transaction? How do we go levels deeper than that? Especially on the consumer side like that. I think it's all the social interactions, all the contextual interactions when you need just a little bit more of yourself than just the public key, just the wallet, I think is when this gets really, really powerful. And kind of signing with Ethereum is just kind of that root of it. It's just kind of the standard. It's just the standard. It enables all this. But I think what it enables, like we're talking about now, those contextual interactions are super, super important, especially as the space evolves to like bring people closer together and everything we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I know that you spend a lot of time thinking about this. And I know that because when we hang out, uh, we geek out about this a lot. So I'm wondering if you could take me into the future. It's the end of 2022 right now. Say it's 20. 2032, it's 10 years from now. If sign in with Ethereum is maximally successful, what will the world look like? What kind of impact will it have on the world? I think if sign in with Ethereum is maximally successful, we really have a world where large companies aren't extracting the value they are anymore from users. I think it's a little bit of kind of blue skies, but I think that's really the case because I think, as we mentioned earlier, now that users control their own identifier or have ways of doing it, I think wallets get to the point where key management is a complete breeze in terms of not like worrying about like, oh no, did I write those 12 words somewhere? I think we've reached that point in that time where wallets have created such great experiences around like recovery, around you know managing these things. And I think we have this world where users are always in control of their identifiers, never worrying about a large company pulling the rug on them or having a data breach and instead are just worrying about new features that are dropping to make the apps and services that much more better for users. That we're not constantly in this world of fear of, oh no, is something going to happen to my data? Oh no, I forgot about that account five years ago and now that app or service has shut down or their data is now posted on the dark web somewhere. I think it's less on that and more about the mm. experiences we're talking about. Um, more on, oh, what app, you know, am I going to be using today that's offering me so much value and, and, and social value? And if I don't like it, that within 10 seconds, I can move over to the next platform and the experience is nearly the same in terms of the things I've brought with me to this platform. And these platforms are just purely competing on services and what they could offer the user instead of being extractive from the user. That it's more focused on the user and more focused on benefiting users than benefiting the bottom lines. And that's mm. what's great about this space is that it, 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 bends all incentives towards that on the experience rather than how extractive a service can be. And I think the 10 year view is if you get to that point, if these standards are working as intended and if key management is in place to make, make it a breeze. And I know we all kind of use the default of like, can my mom use this? And I think in 10 years, absolutely. I think that'll be the case. I'm very, I'm very hopeful for the wallet space in terms of getting it right for users, making sure the design patterns are great, making sure that recovery is great. And I mm. think if we're all there, I think we're really in a great spot with how we interact on the internet, how we take control of ourselves on the internet, how trust gets redefined on the internet, and how experiences evolve as well. Beautiful. Well, uh, is there anything I didn't ask that you want to say, or uh, you know, like is anything anything else that you want to say before we wrap? I just want to say that um, I think what often goes underappreciated in the space are the folks working on open standards that we talk a lot about um, mm. generally when new standards drop. I know folks are talking about account abstraction. Uh, folks are talking about like, what's the new, the new thing going on right now is like, I think the human coordination cost to make, to bring these standards to life, like signing with Ethereum often goes unnoticed. I also want to shout out to like all the EIP editors, the folks who have been keeping yeah. the Ethereum standards going and making sure that they're reviewed, making sure there's a process for them because all this stuff is built on open standards. And the nice thing about this space is that it moves at the speed of light in terms of like a bunch of companies coordinating on bringing something like sign with Ethereum to life, uh, bringing other standards to life, 
really just making sure that everything works so seamlessly. And I just want to definitely shout out to all the folks besides myself working on open standards, using open standards to really try to give users a better experience than what's out there. Because there's a lot of human coordination costs to it. Uh, and that coordination yeah. cost is, uh, it, it's definitely there. Yeah, uh, public goods are good. I feel public like goods standard are good. setting work is a, uh, is a public good. EIPs are one of my favorite public goods. <laughs> that's yeah, a, totally. That's definitely one of them. Yeah. Weird. Well, uh, Rocco, keep up the great work and so great to have you on the pod. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me.